Hello, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Calvin We the Species, Act Two, with Gary Sharanath. Uh, I say Act Two because uh, one of my first interviews back in September was with Girish, who uh, and I, I have to unpack. He's a cell biologist and a neuroscientist with master's degrees, two, uh, in master's degrees in uh, biotechnology and genomics, uh, study of genes, I guess. Um, so uh, Gears and I had met uh, back uh, in the good old days of September, this past September, we met on LinkedIn, instant chemistry uh, and, and the work that he does in aging, uh, uh, we just connected and we, we did our the first, one of my early interviews with Gears. And back in those days, it was a 10 minute interview and he talked about aging. Uh, and we were just talking about that before he we went on air. We could have talked for an hour at least. And, and I cut him off after 10 minutes because that's what I was doing back in those days. Who knew? Who knew? And those days are only September. So uh, we've been talking now for months for Gears to come back and talk about something that is so incredibly important uh, and it's sleep. So this, this interlude is about sleep, why it's way more important than you can ever dream or imagine. And, and Gears is an, an expert on that. So uh, before we jump into that, uh, I'm done uh, doing my thing here. Why don't you say hello, a little background to refresh yeah. memories, and then we'll jump in to your thing on sleep. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thanks, Calvin, for that wonderful introduction. And, uh, you know, just a little bit more background, as you said, uh, cell biology, neuroscience background, uh, upon graduating from Rutgers University uh, from undergrad. I um, went on to work at Sloan Kettering, where I studied uh, brain tumors and targeting various brain tumors with personalized therapeutics. Uh, and then uh, just five, five years ago, I, I transitioned uh, into one of the most uh, profoundly life transforming labs uh, I could possibly have done. And it was in the Department of molecular biology and biochemistry, again, at Rutgers University, where I continue to work full time. And it's a lab that studies the fundamentals of aging biology um, and what happens on the cellular level, really. Like what happens to uh, the, the individual cells of our body that eventually lead to damage accumulation and uh, the manifestation of, of many different chronic diseases of aging, whether they be Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, you name it. Um, and uh, within the lab, uh, I also study uh, every, what, what provides us resilience against these uh, aging pathologies and damage accumulation. And sleep is one of the, one of the big things, it doesn't cost a dime to engage with, but it's one of those big interventions that is too commonly overlooked, but really has just tremendous, tremendous potential to change the way we engage with the aging process. So that's just, that's just a little, little bit of background. You know, what, what got to me early when you were talking about aging, uh, um, I've been uh, an anti-ager mm. for a long time. And, and it's funny, uh, back in pharmacy school, uh, um, when I started doing my supplements, I, I kind of said back in the 60s uh, that I... I I don't know how I could control it, but I said, I'll do everything I can not to age traditionally. So, you know, this guy who's interviewing you, um, uh, you know, has coursed over to three quarters of a century mark. We discussed this, I think, last time. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I do believe, um, I, I think I was sharp now than I've ever been, maybe sharper up here. Um, so uh, that's one of the things I was so magnetically and chemically and uh, nuclear magnetic resonance and all kinds of drawn to you when you're, you're talking about aging. Um, 
and, and uh, I continue to be drawn because it fascinates me. Forever young, Calvin. I've, I've seen you operate, and I'm sure your biological age is uh, just, uh, you know. Anyway, listen, I'm not perfect. Uh, uh, you know, I, I could use a new knee here or there, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it is what it is. But uh, this, to me, is the most important thing. This kind of this kind of runs the show. Um, but uh, I've been so wanting to learn more about sleep, and, and I've been getting tidbits from you as we've been chatting over the last couple of months about this. So, kind of let's let's um, uh, let's pl let's plunge in. Um, um, uh, why 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 do why do we sleep? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And um, really, I find it most effective to put this into the context by looking at the question through the eyes of an evolutionary biologist. So sleep is a process that's present in nearly any organism you can name, from tiny little bugs to gigantic blue whales. And humans, little known fact, but pretty common sense, sleep for up to one third of their lives. 33% of our lives is spent sleeping. So the question becomes from an evolutionary perspective, why would evolution take time away from us when we could be foraging for food, caring for our young, reproducing, and to top it all off while we're sleeping, we're hopelessly vulnerable to predation. So if sleep isn't an absolutely critical process, it's the biggest mistake evolution has ever made. And mother nature just doesn't make catastrophic mistakes like that. So really to answer your question, as a rule of thumb, any organism with a relatively complex nervous system requires sleep to some degree. And the more complex the nervous system, the higher quality of sleep they need. So uh, the tiny little bugs, the fruit flies don't need as high quality of a sleep as dogs and humans, you can imagine. And a major reason for this is because wakefulness, the, the activities of wakefulness, is basically a state of low-grade damage, damage to our brain, damage to our lungs, damage to our liver as we're exposed to sunlight, as we're moving around the physical traumas of that, as we're uh, breathing in oxygen and the damage that that does. Um, so it turns out that Mother Nature has integrated sleep into our lives as a natural repair and rejuvenate system from wakefulness. And what makes us go to sleep, this is a pretty interesting question, because like, what causes that weight of sleep that causes us to sleep at night? And it turns out that sleep's orchestrated by our circadian rhythm. And our circadian rhythm is this daily hormonal cycle that follows a fixed pattern, and it's governed by stimuli such as light, when the temperature uh, you know, goes, starts to go down a little bit, we start getting sleepier. These are some biohacks that we can actually employ um, that we could talk more about later in the podcast temperature changes, uh, uh, when you first take your first bite of food, that starts out the circadian clock in our bodies. And circadian rhythm as it pertains to sleep is conducted by three major hormones. One of them is melatonin, and that's more conventionally known as a sleep supplement. Uh, and melatonin in our body, naturally, as it's naturally produced in our body, that's our master regulator of sleep. And it really preps the different parts of our brain for sleep. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and we can, we, can, we can come back to melatonin, but I'll just mention yeah. the other two. Uh, another one is adenosine. Uh, adenosine is a less known molecule, and that's really, uh, they call it the sleep pressure molecule. That feeling of heavy eyelids, of drowsiness. You know, we've all experienced it sometimes when we're um, in a work meeting or, or somewhere else, hopefully not the car, but some people have even, even experienced that scenario where you just can't control it, the, the, the overwhelming weight of sleep overtakes you. That's actually a molecule called adenosine that's building up in the brain. And adenosine accumulates every minute we're awake. Wow. And once it crosses a certain threshold, we can't fight the sleep. That's when we start, you know, nodding to the music and 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 we can't we can't fight it. So it's interesting because adenosine is this molecule that accumulates every minute we're awake. And when we sleep, that molecule is degraded. So when we wake up from sleep, we feel well rested, we feel alert because there's not so much sleep pressure. And then the third uh, hormone is cortisol. And adenosine is like the sleep accelerator. It accelerates the onset of sleep. Cortisol is like the sleep breaks. Is and that the fight or flight thing? That is. That's is it? Cortisol is a classic stress hormone. It's part of the fight or flight response. And it's responsible for that alert feeling that we have. 
again, knowing these three major players of sleep are important because it allows us to, to modulate uh, the, how these hormones are present in our body um, in order to have a healthier, higher quality sleep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Going back, um, I, I wanted to go back and, and, and um, talk about um, trying to un unpack this uh, about uh, longevity, long, longevity intervention. If you had to start somewhere, uh, uh, maybe incorporating something from the first lecture uh, in, in how that pertains to sleep. Am I making sense? Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, and, you know, sleep isn't um, generally thought of as a longevity intervention, but it's really, uh, it's one of those things that, um, you know, generally as a culture, we don't necessarily think twice about in terms of improving our health and wellness. But as I said before, the process of sleep, and this is something that uh, we've studied in lab in parallel with longevity and how it influences longevity, we're learning uh, uh, and the picture is becoming clearer and clearer that sleep is really a repair and rejuvenate program for our body. So sleep caters to each and every tissue and organ system in our body. It tends to our cardiovascular system and heart health. It strengthens our immune system. And it's really the ultimate restoration uh, system for our brain. So really the bottom line in terms of longevity is sleep's literally our ultimate form of life insurance. And as a society, we really need to start investing more in it. And that's a big uh, topic that I'm, it's something that I'm trying to raise awareness about because in the American culture, we, we really fight against it at, at every level, uh, whether that's uh, with early school start times or residency programs in medical school or just this, the culture of, of uh, I'll sleep when I'm dead sort of mentality. Yeah. Uh... And, and you know, uh, I, I've thought about this this topic and, and listening to and preparing for this. It, it, it is such a wow because I, I I just don't think sleep is really in our culture. You just kind of said that, and it, it's just not a cultural thing. Uh, it's something we do, but uh, the importance of it, and that's we're going to touch on that. Um, so. Um, so what actually is going on in, in this thing up here when we sleep? Yeah. Got a lot of stuff going on, eh? Oh, my God. Yeah, and we, we're just scratching the surface in terms of finding it out. I mean, neurobiology in general, and I'm, I'm a neuroscientist by trade, so I have a uh, I have a little bit of an affinity for it, and I love it as it is, but it's filled with wonders. Um, but the neurobiology of sleep is probably one of the most like fascinating and beautiful things that you can study. And when I first started learning about it, I felt like some of the stuff I was learning was straight out of a science fiction movie. Um, so like, first of all, taking a bird's eye view of the electrical activity, how our neurons communicate, they communicate through electrical activity. Um, the electrical activity of the brain as we're sleeping uh, is, is, is amazing. So if we think of each neuron having its own voice, each brain cell having its own voice, when we're awake, our neurons are communicating like erratically. And if we were to measure their electrical activity, we would see a, a signal akin to something like a, a town, like a Times Square um, uh, with people talking everywhere at all times. And it's impossible to make out one voice in this sea of voices. Um, and this is because different parts of our brain are responding to different external stimuli in different capacities and at different times. So it's really chaos in the brain when we're awake. And one like interesting observation, one of the first things you notice as you measure uh, electrical activity when someone's falling asleep is that um, the brain starts to change in terms of its electrical activity. So as we fall asleep, a part of our brain called the thalamus, which is really our sensory gate, it's what allows external stimuli to be perceived uh, by, by, our, by ourselves, um, it, that shuts down and external stimuli aren't perceived anymore. It goes silent. And at the same time, the thalamus opens up to the sensory stimuli from the inner workings of our mind so that the memories can be played in, in really like the, the amphitheater of our cortex. Memories are just being played within our head. And this is a big part of, 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 of dream sleep. And if we were to measure electrical activity during sleep, we would see that our neurons start to fall into a hypnotic trance, not that chaos of Times Square, but they start communicating in a very methodical and programmatic fashion with pulses of activity and then silence, 
pulses of activity and then silence. And if you think about how many brain cells there are, this is not an easy feat to synchronize the action of so many neurons. Um, but to take a couple steps back, uh, from, from, from the point we fall asleep, our brain starts to move through a series of 90 minute sleep cycles. So each cycle consists of uh, uh, five different stages of sleep that either fall into the category of non-REM sleep, non-rapid eye movement sleep, and there are four of those stages, or REM sleep, and that's the fifth stage. So a total of five stages. And within one 90 minute cycle of sleep, our brain sequentially moves through each of the five stages of sleep. Wow. While non-REM sleep makes up the first four stages, as I said, uh, and they're called stages one through four, and REM sleep is the fifth. And during the first stage of sleep, just to walk you through the process of what's actually going on, first stage of sleep is called light sleep. And then our brain's not still fully shut down. There's still some random outbursts of activity from our neurons. They're still on some level perceiving external stimuli. But as we reach stage two of non-REM sleep, our neurons start to fire in unison. Right? And when I say start to fire in unison, imagine Rutgers Stadium when the whole crowd in unison saying, go are you, go are you. That's, that's you know, there, there's a synchrony to it. And then as we transition to stage three and four of non-REM sleep, that's what's called deep sleep. And that's when there's a monthric pulse of hundreds of millions of neurons firing at the same time. And then the final end of that 90 minute sleep cycle is when we hit the dream street sleep, the REM sleep. And a lot of times we wake up in the middle of REM sleep, that final, final stage of sleep. And really, if you were to measure the ac activity levels of our neurons during REM sleep, um, it would be indistinguishable from wakefulness. It's chaos. We're, we're imagining all sorts of things. Um, and uh, so each of these stages of sleep, stages one through five, right? The four stages of non-REM and then the fifth being REM sleep, there's amazing things happening in our brain. So stage two of sleep, there's consolidation of memories in the hippocampus. Hippocampus is a part of our brain that acts like a flash drive. It stores short-term memories. So during stage two of sleep, our brain is actively storing information from the night before. Say we're studying for an exam or we have a podcast before we sleep or whatever it is, it stores it. Stage two of, 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 of non-REM sleep is critical for storage of short-term memories. Stage three and four of sleep, it's critical for clearing the short-term, it sort of makes it sound like a computer, but uh, it's critical for clearing the short-term storage unit, the, the hippocampus, and transferring those memories to long-term storage. Mm -hmm. So you can see how each of these stages have their own role and they're all important in their same right. Um, and then also in stage three and four, what we call deep non-REM sleep, the, the, our neuronal mass, our brain mass actually shrinks and uh, cerebral spinal fluid, this fluid coursing through our brain, starts to get in between those neurons and clear out the garbage that builds up in between them. So think about that process. Think about like Times Square, all the buildings in Times Square shrinking so that water can flow through the alleyways and clear out all that garbage and gunk that builds up in between them. And this has been shown to be really helpful in terms of neurodegenerative pathologies. Um, and then, and then finally, with, with REM sleep, our dream sleep, uh, dream sleep kind of acts like an emotional therapist. And we could talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, further on in the podcast. Uh, it'll be interesting. But one, one key point I want to make about sleep is that one of the most mind-blowing aspects of our brain during sleep is that within each 90-minute cycle, our brain treats the five stages of sleep like a finger buffet. So it literally feeds on different stages of sleep for different periods of time, depending on our personal needs. So for instance, if we're really stressed or emotional, many of us might be during this COVID time period, our brain will more preferentially feast on dream sleep because REM sleep is important as an emotional therapist for controlling our emotions. If we're um, in a period of learning a lot of information and our brain can actually anticipate that the next day we need to remember those memories and we need to be able to, to learn more the next day, it'll more preferentially feed on stage two of non-REM sleep. It'll spend a longer time frame within that 90 minute sleep cycle on stage two of sleep because it knows, it anticipates that learning. So um, and, and you can go on and so forth. Our brain preferentially feeds on the different stages depending on our needs. So um, it's also important to remember that uh, in general, until 2 a.m., our brain feeds more on non-REM sleep during the 90-minute cycles that we go through. And beyond that, after 2 a.m., it preferentially spends more time in REM sleep. 
So timing of when we go to bed is really important as well in terms of our sleep quality and hitting all of those stages with their important roles that they play. So depending on whether you're an early bird or a night owl, you may be sacrificing different stages of sleep disproportionately. And unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, one thing I learned is that it seems like the ideal time to sleep as inconvenient as it may be, seems to be 9 or 10 p.m. pretty early um, and waking up at around 5 or 6 a.m. That's how our hunter-gatherer ancestors tended to do it. And I, I want to emphasize a point that each person has individual sort of personalized uh, ways of going through the sleep cycles and dealing with it. But this is just a, a general rule of thumb, which is pretty interesting in, ter in terms of how sleep operates. Uh, so dream sleep is really important, correct? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's so many levels. It's, it's so many. Uh, you, you just said, you know, uh, the nine to, to five, um, nine, uh, I, I did that for a couple of years when I was in kindergarten. <laughs> yeah, right. I kind of moved away from it. Uh, <laughs> Haven't we all, right? It's hard. So, uh, so changing, uh, just going in, in, another, um, uh, in another similar direction, um, if you had to choose one thing, uh, uh, exercise, this is important to me, because exercise, nutrition, or sleep, which one would you, I think I know the answer, but which yeah. one would you choose? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> This is a podcast, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, it's an important question because they're all important in their own right. Um, but the reason I emphasize it, it's sort of counterintuitive because most people don't realize the health benefits of sleep as easily as they realize the benefits of exercise and nutrition and sleep is sort of a third wheel. And, and the truth is, it's just as important, if not as more important, um, getting quality sleep really sets the foundation for all other habits we incorporate into our lives. So as I said, sleep engages a system-wide damage response program that clears the body of any damages incurred during the previous day. And it really um, primes our physiology so it's ready to face the stressors of tomorrow. So whether that's the physical activities of exercise or the food we put into our body, to start, the quality of our sleep is absolutely necessary for tending to parts of our brain that are critical for generating uh, emotions like motivation. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, which is one of the most, one of the newer parts, more newly evolved parts of our brain that's involved with executive function, decision making, and motive generating motivation. Um, without a good night's sleep, it's hard to start exercising or avoid that junk food. I don't, we've all experienced some, some uh, flavor of that. Uh, further, a bad night's sleep has profound effects on physical performance itself. So it affects parameters such as VO2 max, heart rate variability, endurance capacity. So even if you manage to motivate yourself to exercise, you wouldn't be reaping the same benefits from your session without an adequate night's sleep. Wow. And so, like, as I said, sleep has a profound effect on maintaining the quality of our prefrontal cortex, this oh so important newly evolved portion of our brain evolutionarily. And this part of the brain plays a critical role also in regulating impulsivity. So that morning breakfast donut or that extra serving of pasta is a lot harder to resist after a bad night's sleep. And that's why I sort of say sleep is, is one, of the, one of the really important ones in terms of emphasis. And, and that is just why we're doing this is because it's so i mean what you said you know exercise nutrition sleep and, and it's uh, i i think if you stop 99 out of 100 people on the street um it's funny listening um yeah listening to you and absorbing um how important it is and you know going to gym the exercise i can almost see someday uh Instead of going to a gym, go into a, a place that will help you sleep for 12 hours. Sleep clinic. Yeah. They, yeah. They, no more monitor, but yeah. It's yeah. Definitely something that can be optimized. So, um, uh, and, and this is a question that's very near and dear to me. Um, do you have some suggestions to uh, help and improve sleep? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and there's just so many things out there and I'm sure I won't be exhaustive in this, but I'm gonna like answer this one sort of rapid fire because there's just so many things on the to-do list and the checklist. And 
um, people could follow up on getting further information on either one or, or however it works. Um, so, but a big point of interest is sleep hygiene. So having like a good wind down routine, and this could include forms of meditation. Uh, and meditation has been shown in the literature to reduce circulating levels of one of these hormones I mentioned, cortisol. And cortisol is that hormone that's the sleep breaks. It doesn't allow us to slip into sleep. Uh, you could see it when people are highly stressed out, when they're going ruminating on thoughts, and that's just feeding their stress response system. Cortisol is high and it's harder to go to sleep. So that's, that's one thing that can be adopted, whether it's meditation or through other ways of relaxation. Um, waking up and sleeping at the same time every day sort of gets your body into a habit of re re releasing melatonin and cortisol in a, in, a, in a regular way so that you can sort of develop a, a sleep habit. Uh, illumin eliminating blue light and incorporating more darkness a few hours before you go to sleep is big because as I said, light is one of those stimuli that activate our circadian rhythm and our body expects light levels to go down as the day progresses because we're so used to, you know, following the natural rhythm of the sun rising and falling and not so, bodies aren't so used to the uh, unnatural like artificial lights, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, I would say uh, keeping a cool temperature in the room. Another thing the body expects as the day progresses is the temperature to fall because as the sun sets and night comes, typically the temperature drops, but now we're, we control the temperature at just the right sweet Goldilocks zone throughout the day, it confuses our body a bit. So this is something else that can help. So typically below 65 degrees Fahrenheit, which is you know pretty cool, uh, but it's something that helps. And um, really controlling the levels of light, the temperature, um, and, and stress levels are the highest, you know, risk to benefit ratio in terms of being the most effective ways at coercing our brain into our more sleepy biological state. But if you were to ask what are some uh, interventions or supplements I can use, I would say interventions, exercise and sauna two hours before sleep has been shown to help release molecules, uh, interleukines to be specific. I mean, you're the saying exercise before, before sleep? Two hours, so not right before two. sleep because okay, two hours because it, it don't, don't, wouldn't the uh, endorphins um, kick yeah. in? So, two hours, but I, two hours or more, two okay. Hours the, okay, I like that as close as you take it. And they've shown that some of the molecules get re, that get released from uh, exercise and also sauna, uh, heat shock, warm bath, they actually promote sleepiness. Um, there are supplements like we were talking about before, uh, Calvin, phosphatidylserine. Um, CBD is uh, shows really? promise as a sleep, wow. sleep, and then melatonin, melatonin, okay. which I mentioned before. Um, so th these are these are some that people could take on an individualized basis. Obviously, they want to do their own research and check in with a licensed medical professional uh, on some aspects of this. But um, but overall, these are these are some of the things that you can engage with, other than you know alcohol, which is not really a, a, a tr it doesn't really uh, initiate a true sleep. Alcohol is more like a chemically induced sleep and you're not really getting a high quality sleep. Although a lot of people think, oh, I, I drink alcohol and it helps me sleep. Um, it's not quite, qu quite the truth there. And, and the same thing uh, applies to sleeping pills in a lot of cases. Okay. Yeah. Um, I get up in the morning, how would I know if I had enough sleep? Yeah, so there's a number of things you can do. Uh, first, I think it's uh, important to distinguish between sleep quantity and sleep quality. So most people think if they sleep from six to seven hours, they're getting adequate sleep. But um, that's there's a difference between how long you sleep and uh, whether you're hitting those stages of sleep, stages one through four of non-REM and the REM sleep. Um, and then is your sleep fragmented or not? Are you working, are you waking up multiple times? I know when uh, my son was first born, that was something that was frequent for me. Do you snore? That's a form of sleep apnea. You're not getting, you, that's uh, reducing the quality uh, of your sleep. There's so many factors to consider, but luckily there's a number of smart devices that can be used to measure sleep quantity and quality. The Aura Ring is one of them, which uh, my wife recently bought me for a birthday present and I highly recommend it. I'm really excited to try it out. Um, it's not perfect, but it's the best in the market. Uh, but the gold standard uh, for, for assessing sleep quality is really going to a sleep clinic and getting something called a polysomnography test. 
polysomnography test. And that measures eye movements, muscle movements, wow. um, as well as brainwave activity to assess really how, what your quality of sleep is like. And then they can give you a more accurate assessment with recommendations, whether you take melatonin or another supplement or what you can do. And really the, like the, the easy way to assess your sleep quality is how refreshed you feel, you feel within the first hour or two after you wake up um, before your cup of caffeine, how refreshed you feel is a good indicator of how, how high quality sleep you had. Okay. So that's, that's another one. Another important question for me, uh, uh, naps. Mm. Do naps count? Yes, they do. There's some really awesome evidence supporting naps. Uh, our hunter and gatherer ancestors actually evolved with what they call biphasic sleep patterns. So they, they would sleep at, uh, they wouldn't sleep their, all their hours uh, at one time. They would sleep at two different time points during wow. the day, uh, which is pretty interesting. So evolutionarily, there's a lot of support there. And also naps are practiced in blue zones. So blue zones are these areas of the world where, um, where, where people tend to live uh, greater than nine, a uh, high percentage of people tend to live to 90, 100, 110 even. And they com one commonality between them um, is they get 30 to 60 minute naps in the afternoon. And examples of these blue zones would be like uh, Icaria, Greece, Sardinia, Italy, Okinawa, Japan. So, so naps are naps are a big one. There's some really good evidence supporting it. Because I love yes napping. <laughs> well, because I stay up to two in the morning every day. But uh, and, but uh, I love love napping. Yeah. So, uh, kind of winding down. Because uh, what happens with you uh, all the time? We can go on and on and on. And, and um, but uh, winding down. Uh, and I'm, I'd like to ask this, uh, can working on your sleep habits uh, extend your life? Yeah, yeah, uh, that, it's an excellent question. And really maximizing our lifespan requires a holistic approach, right? It, it's being mindful of every aspect of our lives from diet to exercise to stress levels, social connectivity, Sleep is one of them, no, no doubt. Um, and sleep really is our number one form of health insurance. Uh, Mother Nature has molded this process over time, over the course of hundreds of millions of years to be our body's maintenance program. Um, and, and it's really charged with taking care of the different body systems, uh, different organ systems of our body. Uh, one, one, one uh, distinction I should make since we're talking about lifespan is the difference between lifespan and health span. Lifespan is the, the number of years you live uh, in your life, but health span is really the right. thing that's important to me um, and, and, and to you too, Calvin. And, and that's, that's that percentage of your lifespan that's spent in good health where you could still offer value to society, where your mind's still sharp, where you're still able to function relatively pain-free with as little suffering as possible and as high quality of life as possible. That's health span. And that's where sleep really shines and improving health span and the quality of life. Just think of a few of these statistics. Sleep is slowly emerging as the number one preventative therapeutic against dementia. It's the number one blood pressuring lowering therapeutic hence lowering the, 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 the incidence of cardiovascular disease or the risk of cardiovascular disease. And something relevant for this COVID environment, it's the number, one of the number one immuno enhancers. So when you sleep, there's been studies done across multiple different uh, organisms from mice, from rodents to dogs to humans. Uh, when you sleep, you're five times less likely to develop cancer when you get adequate sleep. You're more sensitive to vaccinations. That's a big one. Um, and you have dis decreased susceptibility to pathogens. So, uh, you know, to add on to that, behaviorally, sleep disturbances are the major driver of impulsivity and lack of motivation, which I mentioned before. And, and you know, again, this all ties into, in terms of quality of life, this all ties into this public awareness message uh, I'm trying to help send about the travesty of medical training and residency, these early school start times and what they might be doing to children. Um, it's uh, how it's influencing automobile accidents. Driving sleepy is in a lot of is as bad as driving drunk. When you're driving drunk, you have late reactions. When you're driving sleepy, you might not have any reaction at all. And um, cult culturally, we need to rethink the this machismo sort of mentality of I'll sleep when I'm dead. 
and really replace it with, I'll be dead much sooner if I don't concentrate on my sleep. There's a lot of beauty. There's a lot of poetry in the biology behind it. And, and you know, I, I really think that this is a big public health message to be sent. And we've, we've wrapped, we've done a wrap now. Uh, I can't thank you enough for this. Thank you. Uh, I just hope we can get it out to enough people because um, uh, I think if you polled, 99.9% uh, .9 of Americans had no clue about what you just talked about. And this is simple, basic, impassioned, brilliant stuff you just dealt out here. So um, I'll, I'll do my job to get it out and you'll do your job. But I, I, this, is, this is textbook, classic, wonderful stuff. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough, Garrison, and, and, and you and I will communicate because um, uh, I said it to you, you know, a few months ago, come back, and I'm saying to you again, come back, we'll figure it out, but um, I can't thank you enough for your time and your passion and your energy and your knowledge. And by the way, I, I have to tell you something sincerely, not because you're there and I'm here, uh, but this has been very impactful for me uh, as a learning thing because I thought I knew a lot of stuff but I, I don't well I mean Calvin I have to I have to you know tit for tat tell you about the the amazing influence you but this platform has been unbelievable uh the work that you're doing is super influential and motivational I don't know how you keep up the energy it's definitely a reflective of your biological age and and your health but uh what you're doing is just so amazing and, and I thank you so much you really single-handedly started me down a whole new trajectory and path. And I'm just one person and you and a bunch great. of amazing people. So um, thank you so much. And I thank you and I thank LinkedIn for introducing us. And 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 and, and by the way, you've been, you continue to inspire me to do what I'm doing with your your words of affirmation. So uh, we're a great a mutual admiration society. <laughs> Absolutely. When I truly, uh, you've enriched me so much, Gears, uh, and thank you. And you know, our Rutgers thing, and uh, to be continued. And uh, I'm going to send you on your way because you have a, a thing to go to, and I'm conscious of that. <laughs> See, I, I, I'm multi thinking, and um, uh, you and I, you'll be back. Absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.